This is a production of Cornell University. Bernard will lead us off and Peter will take over about halfway through. So without any further ado, thank you very much both for, for joining us today. And Bernard, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andy. And also thanks for the invitation. Uh, you remember we had planned this, I think, earlier this year when we said, let's uh, still meet in, you know, face to face in the US. By that time, you know, we'll know that the COVID situation will have been resolved. Do you remember that discussion? It would actually have been nice to come physically to Cornell. I used to have a bit of cooperation with Cornell some years ago, but it's been some time now that that I've been there. Let's let's maybe book this this next year again or sometime. And thanks also for for allowing us to talk about the new initiative. I'm, I'm de I've developed the slides with my colleague. I'm going to talk a little bit about the broad picture of what we call um, excellence in agronomy. And then Peter will give a little bit more um, zooming in. He will zoom in on an initiative that has basically probably created some of the arguments why we need an excellence in agronomy initiative. So the rationale, why, 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 why agronomy? Why, you know, agronomy is not a new term. It's not a new research area. So why do we need an initiative across the CGR on that? There's a number of arguments we usually present. Um, we know there's been quite a bit of success with crop improvement. If you read publications about the CGR and impact, it's usually around that. But we also know that the expression of what is called genetic gain at scale is not always there. There is some recent work from uh, Simnit who looked at maize, modern, they call it modern variety adoption against national grain yields for a lot of countries in Africa. You see very nicely the picture is quite scattered, although in, in a lot of countries there is quite a bit of an uptake of, of, uh, of um, modern maize varieties. Of course, you also see countries like Ethiopia where there's actually substantial increases in yield. And we know why that is. We know why that is. We know that variety alone is, is not sufficient. We know that you need your nutrient inputs. The other side of the coin also shows, this is for instance FAO data on the left side here, showing uh, fertilizer use over time for Mozambique, Malawi and Zambia. You see a clear increase in Malawi and Zambia. These are maize yields for the same period and you can correlate those data and you clearly see that there is a nice relationship. Of course, not all that fertilizer is applied to that maize, that's, that's for sure, but there is definitely a large proportion of it is in, in Southern Africa, which is which is all maize based basically. So I think we know that, but it's good also to see it confirmed in data. The second argument, and I will not dwell on this one, the science advancement. There's been a lot of development in tools, methods, geospatial statistics, big data analytics that actually allows us to implement agronomy to scale R&D while still being locally relevant. And I'm not going to dwell on this, Peter will dig a lot deeper into this bullet later on. The third bullet, why we feel there is need, there is a large demand for agronomy at scale with a lot of public and private partner sectors, which is new. By new, I mean, it's not new as such, but 20 years ago, this was not the case. So while 20 years ago, you could have done excellent science that demand and, and interest was not there. Today, it is, and I think we know the CTA report from last year, um, uh, conducted by Dahlberg, which shows the sort of uh, D4AC company startups present in Africa, with Kenya here on the left having at least 150 uh, initiatives. We also see on the map here that although the, the number of initiatives in, um, in uh, blue is, is pretty similar between East and West Africa. The users in East Africa, the orange circle is much larger than in West Africa, although, although probably today those circles have changed already. So of all those companies, the insurance companies, agronomy advisory, they are interested in agronomy at scale um, solutions. And the very last point, the CGR reform process, I think Andy alluded to it. There is a reform process ongoing and it gives us an opportunity to organize agronomy r and Since 2005, there's not been a unifying force in the agronomy space in the CGIAR. Um, this is, these are the centers here. I'm, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with the centers, but we are working with 10 centers. 
which are highlighted here. And we currently still have about 130 agronomists involved in quite a lot of initiatives and, and, and spending about 10 to 15% of the budget. So it's still impressive. Uh, when we did this study, we were a little bit surprised, but it's mainly through time bound projects which come and go, which don't create a lot of incentives to cross learn, to share experiences. So we want to change that. Now, what is the purpose and the scope? I mean, this is this is a lot of um, you know big words and, and difficult words, so I'm not going to read this. But basically, what we want to do is we want to deliver agronomy gain for a lot of people, because we know that agronomy gain will have a positive impact on livelihoods, income, soil health, climate re resilience, and we want to do this by setting up. Um, agronomy at scale solutions. Uh, these two words in blue, I will dwell on a little bit. What is agronomy at scale? And we've, we've had that question a few times. Now, what we really want to do is, we want to resolve that conundrum, that, that contradiction that agronomy has been plagued with. On the one hand, agronomy is locally relevant, it's place-based, it it's, it's an adaptive process. But at the same time, we need to work with millions of people on millions of hectares. So how do you resolve this? 20 years ago, it was not resolvable. The only way you can resolve this 20 years ago is you go to a new village and you start all over again. Today, we can resolve that conundrum. So what we want to do in agronomy and at scale is we want to assist people, farmers, decision makers, to take the right decisions on those soil and crop management practices that are taking place once a season, I would say, for annual crops. We want those crop and soil management decisions to be influenced, informed by spatial and temporal variability. We want that advisory to be targeted to end users' needs and to account for yield profitability, sustainability. Peter will explain what this means in practice. The second thing I've mentioned is agronomic gain. We are currently developing a um, conceptual framework around agronomic gain in line with what is called genetic gain. So we are working around four key performance indicators, increased yields and profitability, improved resource use efficiencies, could be nutrients, labor, increased yield stability and improved soil health. And of course, we know that those KPIs will vary in importance or relative importance for, for the various regions of the, of the global south. How are we going to deliver that agronomy at scale and develop solutions and deliver them with partners. So we had a co-creation process with all those centers and the assisted us with this and a number of other um, external partners. And we ended up with the structure around four, what we call modules. This, this sounds a bit, you know, a little bit theoretical and so on, but I still want to explain this because it shows a little bit the different ways in which we want to do agronomy. So on the left side, we have the organize module, which is really hosting the functions related to internal organizations, partnerships. This is also where we do the prioritization and demand mapping. And I think these are two key words for the ones, the new excellence in agronomy initiative. Prioritization, that means having an objective, verifiable framework to decide where and what you're going to do and demand mapping, which means we are going to absolutely respond to demand by real people working with real farmers in, in real regions. So that will happen here. Based on that demand mapping and prioritization process, there will be a number of projects, one, two, two N, which will start and stop, and which will deliver solutions um, at scale, depending on the demand that was formulated. Now, these projects will be counting on and using tools and data and analytics in the transform module, which is this vertical box here, and where we feel there is not enough data or, or analytics available to immediately use in the delivery of those products, we'll go into the innovate module, which is where the innovative, the new R&D will be done in support of agronomy at scale. And of course, this, um, these two central core boxes are influenced by new data collected through these uh, project. 
This slide is, is interesting also because it shows the docking points for partnerships. Um, if we talk, to, you know, to you colleagues in Cornell, we at the CGR, we, we will not claim and we cannot claim that we host all the skills and capacity needed to deliver an agronomy at scale program. So we do have a docking point for international research and academics through the Innovate module. So probably at one time next year, we will start actually talking to Cornell and, and see what this means in practice. We have a docking point for the national system scientists to the transform module because we want those tools to be accessible, used, and, um, em and empowering national systems to use those tools and data. We have our demand partners here, the country engagement, the private sector, all the people who need our agronomy. And we have a docking point for a donor interest group. So this, this, is, this slide is, is, is really in one slide summarizing a lot of the logic and partnerships that we want to set up to deliver on our, on our um, vision. In term, just a few more slides to dig a little bit deeper into those modules. In terms of the organized module, as I said, one of the key innovations that we want to apply in agronomy is have a very, very conscientious process on prioritization. I've worked in agronomy myself for, I usually say more than 10 years, although it's almost 30 years. And sometimes if you look back, you see that a lot of projects, you go, you do your work, your demonstrations, but you don't decide or you've not reflected well on why you do certain activities. And is the enabling environment sufficient? Is the, the, the potential for scaling really there? So we want, to, we want to be absolutely objective and explicit about that. So we, we are developing a three-stage process where we start to define where the agronomy can make a difference in terms of farming systems, countries, and the um, status of our key performance indicators. Within that, do the demand mapping and, and look at the conditions for uptake of agronomy at scale, and then have an ex-ante assessment framework on, on potential solutions on or technology packages that we would like to deploy in response to that demand within a certain geography. So there's a lot of discussion going on. Uh, this is work in progress, but I wanted to highlight this as a key uh, innovation in the way we want to organize our, our agronomy research. The transform module, Peter will talk much more about that. That's, as I said, the core. That's where the data and the data solutions on the left are and where the analytics and turnkey models on the right side are. Just one example, we are going to work quite a bit with the, the big data platform of the 1CGR. This is recent work. So they've looked at their Guardian database, uh, assembled fertilizer response data from 760 locations used machine learning procedures on those data, uh, obtained price data and computed profitability um, in space. And based on that could map the profitability of fertilizer within the continent with not only uh, profitability on average, but also um, error bars around that. So I think this, this shows the power of big data, the power of what you can do if you are better organized than assembling our data. In terms of the, the tools, the turnkey solutions, Peter will talk a lot about our African cassava agronomy initiative. I've shown this slide quite a few times, so now I can also explain it. But I think Peter, Peter will even do a better job. So I will hand the, the, the explanation of this slide over to him. In terms of innovate, this is, I think, where we absolutely need to talk to Cornell and other colleagues in the US and elsewhere. Here we want to do new R&D, which is actually potentially triggering new demand for agronomy solutions. This is just one example on where we want to engage in measuring yield at scale within season to increase the efficiency of our agronomy workflows and so on and so on. But, but there will be a lot of opportun other opportunities to to advance the science of agronomy. The last module, the deliver module, we have actually phrased around a number of key steps around the generic workflow. It took quite a bit of time to develop this workflow, but it's also based on a lot of learning and probably a lot of earlier mistake making. So on the left side, 
Number one, agree on the core partnerships. That's where we place the demand for agronomy. And number two, step number two under that develops the tool, the, the minimum viable product. What is that decision tool that we are going to develop in response to that demand? I will not go into detail with a lot of the other steps, but once you have that MVP described very well, we need to go and assembling the data and the tools, going to prototyping and very important step five, going to the validation process. And, and here we've learned by experience that the validation process is not just a technical process, a set of technical processes. You can test tools, look at the recommendations, implement them and look at yield differences. That's what we would do as agronomists. But we've learned from experience that the user experience, the way recommendations are formulated and made accessible to people, the way they are interpreted, is as important as the technical content itself. And we've learned by doing that, you know, being the demand driven with agronomy at scale, you have to have almost equal importance given to the technical aspects as to the user experience aspects. And then, of course, you go into scaling and so on. So in our current work, we are currently operating a two-year incubation phase. We have identified 10 of what we call use cases that are now under implementation and which are all based on actual demand from a specific demand partner on a specific agronomic issue in a specific geography. So we have six of them in Africa. We have two of them in Asia, one in Egypt, in North Africa and one in Latin America. And each of them um, has a partner, an agronomy need, a cropping system, and a geography in which this will be applied. And of course, I will not have time to go into all this, but maybe to uh, give, dig a little, little bit deeper into one example, the example of digital green in Ethiopia. Digital green is an NGO, probably some of you know them. They are um, planning to reach 25,000 farmers in a wheat production system, and they are interested in how they can increase wheat yields and quality of wheat. So not just yield, but also the quality of the consistency, the nutrient content. So they want advisory on wheat rest surveillance, planting data advisory and nutrient management. That's their demand. They do have a, a platform in which they provide information to farmers via uh, voice recognition or SMS. And they actually have an online platform to collect feedback. So we've set up a partnership with Digital Green, the National Systems, Ministry of Agriculture, and then some cost support from USAID and so on. And this, this use case, which is that tool that will be submitted through IVR of SMS information on this particular topics will then be piloted and validated and, and um, ultimately developed in a form ready for scaling. So this is just one example, but we do have 10 of those examples. So um, this is my last slide from here. Peter will take over. As I said, my job was to sketch in broad lines what excellence in agronomy is about, what we try to do at the same time inviting Cornell to join us, help us with some effort. And I've also tried to probably show that uh, a lot of the tools are work in progress or under development. So we will need support to, to develop, to finish their development. I will stop sharing and I assume Peter will take over now. Yeah, very good, thanks. Thanks Andy, over to Peter. Thanks a lot, Bernard. I can see your screen, Peter. Thanks, Andy, and uh, thanks to everyone for uh, for also giving me the chance to to present some of the work. Uh, um, so, like Bernard gave already uh, quite a number of hints, I'll I'll try and dig a little bit deeper into um, some of the work that's been happening through the African Cassava Agronomy Initiative, or um, or ACAI, and and give some um, some meat to the bone of some of. The, the concept that Bernard has just uh, has just spoken about. So, as a means of um, introduction, um, I just like to show um, a, a typical African landscape, uh, farming landscapes. So this is from uh, from North Tanzania, where you typically see you know lots of small holders um, dispersed in the landscape, 
Um, there's slopes, there's different crops, there's a lot of banana here. Um, different plots, erosion happening. Uh, you see some good plots, some bad plots. Uh, uh, dark green crops and very pale yellow crops. Um, so this is a very typical um, situation um, and providing advice to that is relevant to smallholders, you know, you need to take into account that sort of heterogeneity that, that you'll find. So whatever you're going to promote is definitely not going to work in each and every farm and each and every plot of every farm. But if you if you zoom out um, and if you look at Africa, at, uh, at, you know, from from high up in the sky, there's also a lot of variation at, at that scale. Um, so here you see actually East Africa, you see on top there, you see Lake Victoria and, and on the right, you see Mount Kilimanjaro. So if you if you look at that scale, you know, you, you have to deal with a lot of different soils from very acid to, to actually high pH soils in, in this area even. Um, and, and also that sort of heterogeneity needs to be needs to be taken into account. Actually, that's that's often easier to do because we have digital soil maps. Um, this is this is just uh, some so showing you um, soil pH values um, from from soil grids. I'll talk a bit later uh, more about that. And and this digital soil information we can we can use that when we provide economic advice. So like I said. If we want to advise farmers, you know, over the past decades, we've seen numerous papers that talk about, you know, there is need for local adaptation, um, integrated soil fertility management, you know, requires adapting your recommendations depending on the type, the, the sort of field you're looking at. Um, sometimes you see soil fertility varying as much within a single farm as across the entire continent. So blanket recommendations won't work. Um, there'll never be a, a one size fits all. So that brings me to agronomy at scale and, and what it means um, to, be, to be locally relevant, as the title said, um, but still working you know, at scale to service farmers across, across um, the landscapes and, and the heterogeneity that I've just shown. So what does that approach mean? What we did in, in the project, and I'll, I'll just introduce the project uh, in, the, in, in the next few slides. What we try and do is we, we, we do field experiments, we're agronomists, we like trials, um, and we try and understand um, what sort of interventions work under what circumstances. Then we apply crop models um, to, to predict what will happen in, in sort of the next farmer's field and, and GIS and geospatial statistics to extrapolate that then pour that into some form of decision support tool that we can put in the hands of the farmer and promote and scale that. In very simple terms, that's, that's what the project tries to do. So I'll try and show a little bit in more detail how, how that workflow um, happened in, in the project. But first, before that, these are a couple of sort of things that, that you know, we, we talked about advances in, in the field of agronomy and some of the tools that became available and that we're sort of applying in this project. We're talking about using GIS to assist us with um, sampling locations, but also extrapolating our results. We're doing field trials with very effective experimental designs and, and using actually efficient data management systems within those to make sure that any data we collect, we can actually use within 24 hours after collecting it. We do a lot of stats and, and geospatial work. We use not just trials, but also surveys. Um, sometimes um, um, measuring things in farmers' fields can actually get you answers um, much faster than, than doing trials. Um, we use a lot of methods that are fast and accurate, but sometimes less precise. Uh, sometimes spectral methods in the field to, to look at nutrient deficiencies. Um, also with soil samples, when we analyze those, and we have uh, large numbers of samples, rather than going the, throwing these into a, a wet chem lab, we, we, we try and measure those very quickly using near infrared, for example. Um, crop modeling, I'll, I'll talk quite a bit about that. And, and software and, and decision support tool uh, development. So the African Cassava Agronomy Initiative, this is its uh, logo, is, is one of, um, let's say, a number of sister projects um, that, that uh, have worked on this agronomy at scale. Um, and, and, and of course, this project is now specifically on, on cassava. So we, um, we try to develop new technologies, tailor these, um, 
to the to the heterogeneity of farmers and and deliver recommendations to um, 120,000 farmers. That was our our goal when we set out in, in 2016 when we started this project. We operate in Nigeria and Tanzania, and we work with with many many farmers, um, uh, many many um, partners. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But like I said, the, the, the core thing that we really wanted to, to achieve is really having evidence-based recommendations that are as much as possible tailored to, to be as, as, as locally relevant as possible. So today, some numbers, you know, we've, we've involved over 20,000 farmers in, in field experimentation. We've run over 5,000 on-farm field trials. Those are researcher managed trials. Um, but conducted on farm, and we've taken over 50,000 cassava yield measurements in, in those farmers' fields. More than 90% of all the data we've generated comes from farmers' fields, so we've done actually very little on station work. Um, we work on six use cases. Um, these are sort of demands that were formulated within the project by the primary partners. These partners are people that are on ground. Um, they are NGOs, they are, are fertilizer companies, they are starch processing factories, who actually formulated what they need in terms of agronomy advice um, to, to, to service their, um, their clients, their, their farmers that they're working with. So we have, for example, Fertilizer companies who ask for better blends, formulating better blends. Um, NGOs who work on intercropping practices or, or planting practices, including tillage and weed control. Um, we have starch factories who want advice on when to plant and harvest so that they can get year-round supply of roots to their factories. And several, several partners actually who are interested in, in fertilizer use to, to increase productivity. So, now I'll talk a little bit more about, about the fertilizer work as, as an example. Um, much of the approaches I'll show we've also applied to the other use cases, um, but this one is, is a bit special and, and, and I think a very good example of, of how we work. So we started off, like I said, we're agronomists, we like to do trials and we did, we did many of those and we started with nutrient emission trials, very simple trials where we applied high rates of, of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and then looked at what happened if we omitted any of those um, elements. This is just a typical example. You see you get high yields if you apply the nutrients. You, you take those nutrients away, the yield drops substantially. But there's a lot of variation. We don't see the same everywhere. Um, this is just an example plot from our first season in Nigeria. So we see that in some farmers' fields, Omitting nitrogen um, reduces the yield a lot. In other plots of farmers, it, it's not so much the case. In the meantime, we've done uh, many, many of those, of those trials. We've done about, I think, close to a, a thousand of them. Um, we have over 5,000, close to 5,000 plot yield measurements. So that, that data sort of served us to, to start doing some modeling. And we actually coupled two um, two models, we, we used Linto, and more recently, actually, we switched to DSAT um, to, gather, to give us water-limited yields using geospatial weather data. And uh, we used soil data, also geospatial soil data, and fed that to QEFTS. Um, but we, let's say, dismantled QEFTS a bit and um, replaced some of the parts by machine learning to predict um, indigenous nutrient supply from the soil. And we also combine that with um, some, some variables that we got from the farmer himself. Um, so we use soil grids. Um, but this is just the, maybe this is again pH, I think. Soil grids actually offers um, digital soil information on, on most of the um, traditional uh, soil, uh, soil parameters. And then what you typically see is these are, this is more recent data. This is um, yield with fertilizer versus, versus a control yield. Um, and you see the sort of typical spread. Um, you have um, typically with higher yields, um, more variation, but also larger responses. 
until you reach, of course, very high yields, and then you don't see yield decreasing anymore. Now, what you see is actually that the current yield is often best, the best single um, indicator for the expected response. If you see the yield is low, typically you also expect that the fertilizer response will be low. And we use that information to define some yield categories, and, and farmers can easily identify with them if you, if you turn that into um, pictures, for example, like this, and you tell them, you know, this is the typical cassava plant, you know, which one is the most common in your field, and, and they can actually easily relate to that and say, you know, my field, most often our plants look like this. So that's a way for us to actually identify what kind of, of um, yield category or, or, or yield class we're, we're dealing with. And that's one of those variables that we, and we added to, to the model to, to predict indigenous nutrient supply. Now, from all that data, we're also able to, to see what kind of, um, at what level variability in, the, in, in nutrient response occurs, and maybe not unexpected from, from the pictures I showed in the beginning. Some of that variation happens at a very local scale. That's, that's in this case, the, the green part of this bar between fields from one field to another, at a very, um, at a very small scale, but also at the regional level, um, referring back to that, to that map of, of East Africa, where you see between regions at a, at a much larger scale, also an important level of variation. Now, if we try and, and predict that um, using soil information from soil grids alone, um, we didn't do too well. Um, we get the R squareds of 0.3 to 0.5 at most. So we're not able to really predict um, nutrient supply um, and response consequently. But if we combine that with that sort of local information um, that we got from the farmer, including those yield categories, um, we did substantially better and, and good enough actually to, to start predicting um, and going further with that. So we get R squares of 0.6 to 0.8, um, which we were very happy with. Then the next step, of course, is um, we, we also need the, the yield ceilings. So we need to know what, what water limited yields as, as sort of the maximum level um, of yield that farmers can attain. Now for cassava being um, an annual crop, an indeterminate crop actually, um, farmers plant cassava almost at any point in the year in, in Nigeria. And they will also, also harvest it at, at any point of the year, sometimes very early after eight, nine months, sometimes they leave it in their field for 15 to 16 months. So this has important implications also for the kind of yields that farmers can, can get and what kind of responses to fertilizer so to, to take that into account, we used DSAT and we ran over 460 million gridded runs of that model with rainfall data from the past 25 years. So that gave us um, data like this for one pixel, for example, depending on when farmers plant and harvest, we could have a prediction of what the yield would be. And also interestingly, some, some, uh, some level of confidence or variation due to rainfall. Um, which helps us to, to make predictions on, on risk and uncertainty on, on fertilizer response. So then we're not done. We still, then, then we have yield predictions, we have fertilizer response predictions or nutrient response predictions. Um, but to give advice to farmers, we don't need to tell them how much N, P, and K to apply to get a certain yield. We need to tell them how much fertilizer to apply to get a certain net return on that investment. So a farmer is not necessarily interested in getting the highest yield, but the highest profit. So we coupled all this then to an economic optimizer, um, which basically converts nutrient responses to fertilizer responses. Instead of yield, we optimize for net revenue. So that allowed us to build maps like this one, for example, these are two states in Nigeria, and on the left it shows um, a recommendation for a urea application, and on the right hand side, the kind of yield improvements that farmers can expect for a certain yield class this is. So we can provide this to extension workers, and, and they can use that to do cost benefit analysis, for example. 
Um, when we run this on a smartphone, and I'll talk a bit later about that, we can actually work with, work with the GPS capability of the smartphone to do this at a much higher resolution. And then it looks more like this. So then the last step in that whole process, after we've done all that work, we want to actually validate that the recommendations we come up with are, um, are good, are profitable for farmers. Um, so what we did is basically laying out lots and lots of very simple trials, just two plots, a control and our recommendation, just next to each other. We color coded them, um, blue and yellow in this case. And we did many of those. We did over 5,000 of those. And then we can look at how farmers actually performed. And we see that over 75% do realize a yield and a profit improvement. And only 2% actually had an, a negative impact. So with fertilizer, you don't expect really much negative yield um, effects. But fertilizer costs something. So it's not just um, yield effect, but it's also getting that, that money back from your investment in fertilizer. So that made us very happy. And this is another way of looking at these results. These are cumulative probability distributions. So the more the curve to the right, um, the larger the proportion of farmers that, that had a, a positive um, return on their investment or positive yield effect in this, in this case. Um, so we did that during during two seasons in, in both Nigeria and Tanzania, and, and we were really excited about these results. Um, now, we've done all that. Next question is then, how do you put that actually to use in, in the hands of a farmer? How can a farmer access that information and, and actually do something with that without, without us needing to to intervene directly. Now this, this is where Akilimo comes into place and this is the name that we've given to, to our decision support system. Um, it's turned out more of a, a platform now today, um, but Akilimo is actually two Swahili words um, pulled together. It, it's Akili, which, which, which means um, brain literally or, or smart and Kilimo, which means agriculture. So, Giving that, that, that whole thing actually a name has, has also um, really helped us to, to, to sell it. Um, and this is the slide Bernard, Bernard referred to. So this sort of um, embodies what, what Aquilimo is. It's a, it's a digital service to provide tailored agronomic advice. So on the left box, you see all that, all that science we've done. Um, all that data and all those models, they, they sit on a cloud-based prediction engine um, that can run those models with, with input um, provided through different interfaces. That's the, the, the middle box there. Um, and we built two of those interfaces ourselves. We, we've built a, a smartphone app. We've also made some simple tools that people can print that, that uh, um, simplify those recommendations to, to, to a two pager that, that people can easily print and work with. Um, but in the meantime, we work with several digital ag companies who have integrated that service into their service. And, and some of these um, provide the recommendations over an interactive SMS system or through a chatbot um, or through a, an IVR, an interactive voice response um, system so that farmers can actually directly interact with our recommendations. These are examples of those two pages, those printable for, um, leaflets that, that basically show in, a, in an as visual way as possible um, the, the critical elements. They go hand in hand with, uh, with worksheets. Again, two pages um, where farmers are basically led through um, the, 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 the basic calculations that need to be made. And we've trained extension workers to help farmers complete those and they're available all. In, in local languages, seven or eight local languages in the meantime. These are some screenshots from our, from our app that we've built. The app obviously um, gives a much higher precision than the paper-based can. Um, but limitation there is that many farmers don't have smartphones and that this sort of, this, this sort of tool is, is mostly used by an extension worker who would interact with farmers. So our reach is, is, let's say, much more limited than with, with printable tools. 
Now, coming to the end, um, some conclusions that, that you know, we've, we've been um, coming to in the last, let's say, one, one year, maybe a bit more. We've, um, we've been pushing this, this sort of system through um, the, 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 the dissemination strategies of our partners. And today, over 82,000 users are, are actually registered and applying our recommendations. Now, for farmers to, to actually profit or, or gain from those recommendations, they, they need to be reached first. They need to understand how to use them. They need to effectively use them, um, do something with that information in their farm, and then, and then realize their profit. So at each of those steps, we can, we can get some feedback of, of what is happening in their farms. And, and we've done a lot, quite a bit of survey work. Um, we've done um, some, some, some um, um, choice experiments, for example. We've done uh, phone interviews and SMS surveys, and we're getting a lot of interesting feedback. And we're seeing, for example, that um, use and uptake is, is very much affected by maybe the traditional factors. Age, younger people are often more quick to do something with this sort of stuff. Um, educated farmers typically more than, than, than illiterate farmers. Um, as with traditional extension systems, we often see that men um, have more access to these sort of tools than women. Often women don't have a phone and, and are relying on their husband for, for getting a phone. So it's, it's not necessarily true that digital methods are as accessible to, to women as to men. Wealth state is very important, whether they are growing cassava for the market or for sustenance. Um, the dissemination methods that are being used in the tool format, all these have, have an important impact on, on, on use of our tools. This is my last slide. Um, very interesting also, this is some very recent work, is, is when we look at behavior and, and perceptions around our tools, we've, we've actually confronted farmers with um, 40 different statements to do with the user friendliness, the, 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 the trust and, and, and confidence that our recommendations will improve yield, perceptions around risk and, and cost and affordability, um, market orientation, um, orient um, attitude towards innovation. If we look at all these things, um, what comes out very clearly is that if, if, you, if you use um, variable selection methods to see which sort of perceptions determine whether a farmer is going to make use of your recommendations or not, what comes out in the very top is everything to do with, with the user experience. So if they can access the advice quickly and it's all intuitive to, to use those tools, that is going to determine half, halfway already um, whether that farmer is going to do something with that advice or not. Um, so with all the science we've invested, you could actually argue that, that as much effort would need to be invested in, in, in making those tools as user-friendly as possible because, because that determines whether all that will have any impact. And then next in line, um, luckily for us, agronomists follows the perceptions around yield and revenue, um, some cost and market access. And maybe surprisingly last in line is, is you know, the attitude towards innovation. How often do they actually interact with extension services or have they made any investments in their farm in the past? So like I said, Aquilimo, we're trying to push it into uh, turn it into um, more of a community where people can contribute and interact and, and turn it into a learning platform, um, making it available to the excellence in agronomy and, and transforming it into something that can grow and, and, and inspire um, a lot of the work that will happen through, through excellence in agronomy. Um, I need to acknowledge all the organizations that, that, have, that have worked and all the people in these organizations, and they are, they are really many. Um, I, I can't possibly name all of them. You can see from the logos that, that there are really a lot of organizations, but many not mentioned here as well. Um, and with that, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you for listening and be happy to answer a couple of questions. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Bernard. Um, we have a couple uh, minutes for, for questions, so I'm going to open the floor. Uh, are, there, are there questions for, for Peter or Bernard?
I have a question here. Louis speaking. Please go ahead, Louis. Yes. Um, so I was wondering if you have experience with uh, accessing farmers' data, such as uh, uh, like the planting date or how much did they apply and how much did they actually harvested? Is there a way for you to access that data via maybe smartphones or such uh, technologies? Um, on, on planting and harvest schedules, we have quite a bit of information. Um, well, in the research process, we gathered that through surveys, but now that people are using our tools, um, we actually get that information as part of the input to the recommendations. So we, we, we ask farmers when they plant and when they intend to harvest to be able to calculate um, a sort of, of, of expected yield for that, for that planting and harvesting schedule. Um, getting yield data is is actually a very tricky thing. It's it's um, it's not easy, and definitely not for a crop like cassava, which is a which is a root crop, um, where often what you see above ground not necessarily says much about what you'll find below ground. Um, we've we've experimented with a couple of methods to. Um, to combine quick above ground measurements with, with minimal uprooting and sampling of well, crop cuts and, 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 and sampling plants um, with modest success, I would, I would say. But yeah, getting yield data in, in smallholder farms fields in a, in a quick and, and sufficiently accurate way is, is I think still a, quite a challenge. Andy, thanks. Please go ahead, David. Yeah, uh, when I saw the tool, it looked very nice. You gave them one statement about what they could expect to see, but you have behind that a lot of simulations. So couldn't you give them a an uncertainty estimate on that also to say, well, this is what we think you will get if you do this recommendation, but uh, we this is kind of the range. And would that then allow them to make a kind of a, um, a risk-based decision for themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. We we, um, we we we've tried several ways of actually visualizing or explaining risk to to smallholders, and that's not easy to do. Um, very often, when you when you confront them with ranges, they they tend to um, forget the lower end and and go for the upper end and and get very optimistic. Um, so what we've actually done is, is, is um, ask them uh, how often they, they invest in, in technologies and then assume that farmers who often invest in technologies are more the um, risk-loving type of farmer. And, and then what we do is we actually set our threshold for profitability lower for those farmers than, than for farmers who, who never invest and who can't afford uh, um, losing money. So, oh, that's very clever. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. And there are more questions from the floor. Yeah, I have a question. Hi, this is Johannes. Hi, Bernard. Good to see you. Hi, um, yeah, nice to meet you, you Peter. And uh, thanks for coming, <laughs> um, even if it's not the traditional way. Um, I was wondering, you obviously you spend a lot of time, and, and it looks superb, uh, your interface to the farmers and and, and the populations in rural communities um, where you employ really nifty uh, tools. Um, how does that look on the, on the upstream side? Um, Bernard, you mentioned uh, your, your desire in, in, in reaching out more in a more organized fashion to the academic research community, um, but you spend a lot, of, a lot less time in, in, uh, in, in employing these kind of next generation tools to to pull in uh, knowledge and expertise and skills from, from upstream as you do downstream is is there something that you can learn from the downstream side to to engage both in in a more rapid iteration with innovation but also the longevity of um, building strategic partnership i think i think there's both of those and they're not they're not going hand in hand necessarily i was wondering about that what your, what your strategic well, maybe, maybe one maybe one comment Johannes you know this this whole initiative is new and I've tried to 
What Peter has been showing is, is one project uh, that started in 2016, but the bigger picture I've tried, to, the boring part of the seminar, you know, that's the new initiative that's being constructed since uh, maybe one year now. So one, we recognize the need for innovation, we recognize the need for linking with institutes like Cornell, but we want that innovation box also to be demand driven. Uh, to a certain extent. We don't want to do the things we would love to do. We want to do the things we should do in uh, response to needs and so on. So the probably will be a little bit opportunistic because you also need to explore new avenues in agronomy at scale and, and we will do that. But we want to use the fields, the sort of things that Peter has been showing. I think he referred to a few items which were difficult or hard or not satisfying. I think these are very good entry points into innovation R&D that we want to invest in to exactly increase the efficiency of our agronomy workflows and, and so on. So absolutely. Um, we are, if all goes well, and then there's an if with the capital, if all goes well, then uh, we'll probably um, start working on a much more defined initiative, probably, you know, from quarter two next year with an end line of quarter four next year. So there will be an intensive period of, of reflecting on the sort of question you just asked, but many other questions. And um, I think that would be the good time to touch base again, uh, Johannes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, this Hi, is Andy, can I ask a question? This is Janice. Uh, Janice and then Harold, please go ahead, Janice. Okay, terrific. Um, I'm interested in knowing the role of soil analysis underpinning all of this. I mean, how much of that is done or do you really rely on historical yields to predict what's needed? And I guess my question is really leading to whether so the soil doc system is involved here, whether that's part of this program or not. Thanks. Will you try, Peter? I can um, comment on, yeah, go not. ahead, Peter, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it's it's not though. At some point, we we had some some discussions with um, with Patrick, uh, and we wanted to try out whether whether having the soil doc data as as additional covariates in our prediction model um, would would improve improve our predictions. Um, like I showed, we we currently rely on the soil grid data. Um, alongside with, with local information that the farmer provides himself or herself. Um, and, and we don't include actual measured soil data at this point because most farmers would not have such data, obviously, for their, for their farms. Um, right. But it's, it's I think the key that we the, thought about at some point, but, but have not, never yeah. really I think the key point, Peter, is that if you use all those geospatial information layers that are available, everything, you know, even soil grids, anything, and you predict what inherent nutrient capacity would be, you don't get very far. But no. if you add one measure of local quality to that, you get very well to 0 0.7, 0 0.8. With 0 0.7, 0 0.8, you can do business. With 0.3, no. you cannot. And that local, what we've seen or what Peter has shown is that you don't necessarily need to analyze your soil. Just a pictorial appreciation of yield is good enough. Okay. You can imagine the cost and time and effort, you know, yeah. to <laughs> let people look at the picture or, or take a sample and analyze it. I mean, it's a totally different Absolutely. ball Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, thanks. Will that stand everywhere all the time for all crops? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it's nice to see it for cassava. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Thanks, Janice. Harold, you had a question. Yeah, um, well, first of all, thanks gentlemen for an outstanding presentation, beautiful slides and uh, very informative. Um, I, I just uh, kind of following up on Janice's question. So you're, you're looking at you know, some of the, the basic soil properties and soil grids and, and, um, and nutrient contents. And then you're also looking at in a way yield potential and, and so to some extent, you're dancing around the concept of soil health um, and, um, and your approach is, is fantastic. And uh, so in a way it takes, maybe this is the sort of the general 
quality or health of your soil. And this is then what you need to do. These are our recommendations. But I was just wondering, you could also sort of turn it around a little bit and say, um, you know, you can improve the productivity or the health of your soil, uh, whichever way you express that, uh, if you do this or that. So you can make your soil more like this other soil and thereby enhance the productivity of that soil. And, and so I was wondering whether in your communications through, through this app, you may have an opportunity to, to sort of bring that concept also into, um, into the communications that you have with the farmers. Because, you know, obviously you're, you're mostly focused on mineral fertilizers, which is fine. That's, you know, that's typically the first step. Um, but I, I just w was wondering whether you've thought about taking that um, to a different level by, by, by bringing in concepts around soil health and how you can help these farmers sort of achieve higher yield potentials by uh, enhancing the quality of their soils. Yeah, um, yeah it's, a, it's a very good question. And maybe, maybe the impression from my slides is indeed that we heavily focus on, on fertilizer, though this is I mean, just one use case. And um, in, in many of our tools, we, we actually emphasize the importance of, for a farmer to, to know the productivity of his field. Um, we often visualize also that you could look at a field from being very poor to very fertile. And if it's very poor, you need to think about improving that soil by, we actually have in all, in all our tools, you know, promoting the use of manure or compost or um, re crop residues and recycling those. Um, and, and also emphasizing these for, for, for long-term productivity that, that you need to maintain your soil, you need to avoid erosion. So all those things, they, they definitely come along um, with, with the advice. Um, but but the, the incentive for a farmer to, to invest will, will always be the, the short-term profit that he can realize from, from an investment in, in tillage or fertilizer or, or a, new, a new variety. Um, just alongside with that, you, you really need to, to provide also the advice of, of how to ensure long-term productivity. I, I very much agree with that. Not sure if I answered your question, though. <laughs> Harold, does that uh, you have a follow-up? Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't want to just pick up all the. All the, all the I understand the models, models. Um, but I you know, I mean, it's a, it's a consideration to to think because I yeah. think you have a, a very rich um, set of a very rich data set that I think you could employ probably effectively in terms of of you know maybe helping farmers understand, you know, how soil productivity um, can be enhanced, not, not only by applying mineral fertilizers, but um, um, by other, you know, you know, physical, biological sort of uh, approaches. Um, and, and, and in a way you have, you have so much data at hand that um, I think with some creative thinking, you could really enhance that. I, I think it's just a an opportunity that I just sort of wanted to point out, and I don't really have really good answers, but I I, I think there's something there that could be pursued. No, I think Harold, the, the main entry point towards improved soil health is via the organic resource pathway. Um, that's that's one of the most viable, you know, entry points. And we all know in a lot of those systems, the most limiting resource is organic matter. So how do you increase then availability of organic matter if you don't have fallow systems anymore? And I think, you know, we've always seen that somehow passing through crop residues is, is a good way forward. And, and we know that to produce crop residues, you need your nutrients and so on and so on. Um, of course, in, in fallow systems, which do still exist in large parts of, uh, of Africa, the situation is of course different. And, and there you have, you have those resources available. So it's 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 a mix of you know knowledge and, and availability of resources that will will drive what what are your entry points towards better yields. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, just adding on. This will be a rich subject for when you guys uh, get. But this to is something we should discuss when we are live in uh, Cornell, you know, and you know, and. Absolutely. September, Bernard. September. September next year, yes. I'll be vaccinated. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, look, we are we are way over now. You guys have been very generous with your time. It was a really fantastic uh, uh, joint presentation, and uh, I really look forward to, as we said, inviting you to be spend time with us in the fall as yeah. some of the new projects mature and and uh, yeah. affording, of course, the, the opportunity for for deeper discussions. But on behalf yeah. of everyone who's attended, thank you so much. I really deeply appreciate yeah. it that you you guys made time for this. Yeah, and, and we thank you also for making time for listening and and let's yeah let's uh, let's let's keep this discussion warm and 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 colleagues yeah. Thank you everyone. All right. Have a nice rest of the day. Yeah. Bye. Thanks again, Bernard Peter. Really yeah, appreciate. Really it. Intense, yeah. Take care. Talk to you on Monday, Bernard. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.